أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد My respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome you to this course on the Islamic belief system or what we call Aqaid in Arabic. Our belief system represents the most important dimension in our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, as He tells us in the Quran, to worship Him. Worshiping God begins with ma'rifah, with knowing the Almighty God, with believing in Him, believing in what He wants us to believe in. Therefore, the most important aspect in our lives is our belief system. According to one hadith, the Holy Prophet ﷺ, when he sends one of his companions by the name of Ma'ad, he dispatches him to Yemen. The Prophet, peace be upon him, tells him, فَلْيَكُنْ أَوَّلَ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يُوَحِّدُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى O oh, Ma'ad, the first thing that you should invite them to when you're going to Yemen and preaching to the people of Yemen, the first thing that you should invite them to is the belief in the one God. It starts with the belief system. فَإِذَا عَرِفُوا ذَلِكَ Once they come to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ فَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ Then let them know that you have branches of faith, there are actions such as prayer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mandatory for them. So everything begins with ma'rifah with knowing the Almighty God, knowing the religion of God. It's our belief system. In fact, when you examine the word Muslim, Muslim is highly misunderstood, the definition of it. Many people think that Islam or Muslim comes from the word peace. Yes, Islam is a peaceful religion. A Muslim is a peaceful religion decent human being because the Prophet peace be upon him in one hadith says, who is the Muslim? Man salim an nasu min yadihi wa lisanih. A true Muslim is the one whom you're safe from. You're safe from his tongue and you're safe from his actions. So yes, a Muslim should be peaceful but that's not the definition of a Muslim. Islam comes from the word that means to submit, submission, to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to accept and embrace the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a difference between knowledge, what you know, and what you believe in. What's the difference between knowledge and belief? Can someone explain to us the difference between knowledge, knowing something, and between believing in something. Are they the same or there's a difference? There's a difference. Can you summarize that difference for us? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, when He speaks about the people of Prophet Musa, peace be upon him, when God refers to the Pharaoh and the evil ones, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا They rejected the truth. Even though their souls had certainty, they had the knowledge, they knew the truth, yet they rejected it. So the Pharaoh and his people, they did have knowledge. They knew what was right and what was wrong, but they failed to believe in it. There's a difference between knowledge and between belief. Knowledge is when you have facts, it's just information, when you come to know something. Islam wants us to go a step further than that. In addition to acquiring knowledge, once you've found the pure knowledge, submit to that knowledge, accept it in your heart. 
That's the meaning of Islam. That's what a Muslim means. The one who's come to know the religion of God and he or she accepts that religion of God. So this is the meaning of the word Islam. And this is the meaning of the word Aqa'id. We've all heard of this word and we use this word commonly, right? Aqa'id in Arabic, is it singular or plural? What kind of word is it? It's plural. What is the singular form of it? Aqidah. Aqidah, from what root word is it derived? Aqid or Uqda. And what does Aqid mean? Or what does Uqda mean? To bind or to knot. Uqda is a knot. Now can you guess what does Aqaid and the belief system has have to do with a knot? With binding something? What does it have to do with it? Why is the Islamic belief system in Arabic called Aqaid? The knots. I don't know, just guessing. Maybe because it's the foundation of the religion and your, your actions are going to be based on it. So. Yeah, but what is that knot referring to? Because when you have a knot, you're tying something, right? The beliefs and the knowledge. Right. When you have knowledge and you bring your heart to accept that knowledge, it's like tying a knot. You take your heart around a belief system and you tie your heart around it. This is figurative, of course, it's symbolic. That's the meaning of aqa'id. When you've allowed your heart to embrace something like a knot, and you've seen the knot, right? It's pretty tough, it's pretty hard, it's pretty strong. You want to untie a knot, it's pretty difficult. So that's the meaning of the word aqa'id in the Arabic language. These knots that we have, that we take our heart, we wrap it around these beliefs to make them firm beliefs. It's not just facts that you know. Facts that you know they can come and go. But the aqa'id, the belief system is fixed and it stays. And that's really the definition of a true Muslim. The one who submits to God and submission comes at very different levels. You have the submission of someone who just, at least in theory, accepts that there is one God only, and that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. And then you have the submission of who? Of someone like Prophet Ibrahim in which the Quran describes to us his submission, how he and his son, Ismail, submitted themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he instructed his sons not to die except as Muslims. Muslims who embrace the religion of God. And that is exactly why you'll find the religion of God since the day of Prophet Adam until this day is called what? It's called Islam. Every religion of God is called Islam. Because God wants the human being to submit to his laws and commands. Yes, you have what is called the Sharia the code of conduct, the legal details, the rituals, these differ from one religion to another. So the Sharia of Prophet Musa السلام, is called what? Judaism. The Sharia of Prophet Isa السلام, we can call Christianity. However, all of these religions are Islam because Islam represents that path that brings you to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the most as important aspect of our life is our belief system. Therefore it's incumbent on us to pursue our beliefs, investigate what our beliefs are, and to develop the proper beliefs. The first thing that God will question us in the grave is what? We have many many hadiths from Sunnis, from Shias, that state the first thing God will ask you in your grave is about your belief system. Who's your Lord? What's your book? What's your faith? Who's your prophet? After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you these questions, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us about our actions. How did we spend our life? So everything starts with the aqidah. And hence you find the verses of the Holy Quran when Allah is addressing the human beings 
and commanding them to do good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always states, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu wa amanu salihat. Those who believe and offer good deeds. Good deeds are always preceded by beliefs. Because beliefs form the foundation. Now when we speak of aqaid and the belief system, in the religion of Islam we have three core beliefs. In fact, every religion of God is founded on these three core beliefs. First is monotheism, the belief in the one God, Tawheed. That is the basis of every religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to humanity. Number two is prophethood, that God has messengers who communicate His message and show us the right path. God, for reasons that inshallah we'll discuss throughout the course, chose to send us prophets and messengers, not directly communicating to us. Allah could have communicated to each one of us directly and He could have revealed, you know, His holy books to our hearts directly. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to communicate to us through messengers, through His representatives. And this is why, by the way, when we also communicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because some Muslims will tell you, look, it's just you and God, right? You don't need any prophet, any imam, this is all shirk. Why should you turn to an imam when you can directly turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When Allah decided to communicate with you and to send you His signs, He chose a human being, right? He chose certain individuals, representatives. In the same way for you to worship Him and to communicate back to Him, yes, you can always speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, but you need to go back through those same individuals who brought you the message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to send to send his message through Muhammad and Al Muhammad and his family. In the same way, if we want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we go through them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent prophets and messengers and they communicate to us his signs. This is the second core belief that we have and the third one is the belief in the, in the, belief in the day of judgment. So these are the pillars of faith. Now you've heard that the pillars of faith are five, right? Well, the justice of Allah, which is usually introduced to you as the second pillar of faith, that's an extension of Tawheed. It's an extension of believing in God. And another one which is Imam, the belief in the successor, successorship to the Prophet, that is also an extension of what? Prophethood. So when you examine Islam at its core, it boils down to these three main points. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His oneness, prophethood, the day of judgment. This is the core of all religions of God. And every prophet of God who was dispatched by God to preach to humanity, preached these three core principles. When you examine these three core principles, with their two extensions, the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the imamah, those who represent the Prophet after him, you find that while religion is so comprehensive and detailed and sometimes it could appear to be complicated, but at its core is very basic. It's very, very basic. Some people sometimes will come to you or they'll come to me, they'll tell me, Sayyid, with all these religions out there, with all these ideas and sects and ideologies, how do I know Islam is the right religion? How do I know? I can't spend my entire life investigating, right? I can't spend years and years studying Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and all these hundreds and thousands of other religions. There are more than 4,000 religions out there. How can I go and investigate? How do I know Islam is the right path? If you examine these three or five core beliefs, it becomes very clear that the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as revealed in 
the Holy Quran is the correct path. Let me take you through this process very briefly, just you can, you can see how the religion of Allah is based on these core principles. So there are 4,000 religions out there. The first question that a human being, an intellectual human being asks is I didn't come here through my own efforts. Someone, some system put me here on earth. Therefore I have a creator. I know that I have a creator. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that God does not need anyone. He has no partners. So there is only one God. The intellect will point you to a one God. Now when you're examining 4,000 religions, any religion that preaches idolatry or says there is no God such as atheism, which is a type of religion really, you can immediately cross that up. You don't have to go and investigate 4,000 religions. Let's say you have a list of 4,000 religions and all you need to do is start with the first point. Which of these religions preach that there is one God? Because I know I have a creator. I didn't just pop out of nowhere. Even if I believe in evolution and everything these scientists are telling me, there is an intelligent being who put this system. Evolution can exist on its own. It requires an intelligent creator who created this system. So you can cross out every other religion. Then you come to the next one which is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will find many sects within Islam, they reject the justice of God. Historically, for example, for example the early Ash'arites, they would reject, they would say God can do whatever He wants. If God wants to do injustice, He can. No one can stop Him. He is the all-powerful. Or sometimes when you see certain things being attributed to God, you find that they defy His justice. So immediately you can cross out those sects because your intellect tells you that God must be just. Then you come to prophethood and the messengers of God. Then you go to Imam, these core principles and your intellect will direct you to the point that God will not leave us without a guide. Just God, just as God sent us messengers and prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also assign individuals, representatives who will guard the faith. That's the meaning of wilaya. When we talk about the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt, what does that mean? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they did not bring any new religion, any new sharia, any new laws. Their main role was to protect the religion of God. They sacrificed for the religion of God. So the intellect will dictate you to the idea of imamah, that God will not leave people without a guide. So automatically you can cross out all those sects that tell you, you know what, today you don't have an infallible representative of God. Kings, rulers, they are your imam. You have to follow them. This does not make sense. The intellect tells you God must choose them for you. Now this is at the very basic level. We will go in depth when we examine each one of these points. And then the day of judgment. Any religion that does not believe in an afterlife, you can automatically cross it out. Because God, if He exists, is wise. He has a purpose. He did not create us in vain. Therefore, God must have a day of judgment, a day of reckoning in order to reward the good doers because this world is not a suitable place for God's reward. Many people work so hard day and night, they sacrifice. In the world they don't really see that reward that a generous God would give. And what about the evildoers? Those who commit acts of injustice, the tyrants, the oppressors, Many of them get away with their crimes. Criminals sometimes can get away with their crimes in this world. There must be a day of judgment, otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have created this life in vain. You create all these people, some of them suffer, some of them commit acts of injustice and that's it. Everybody dies and there's no afterlife. So the intellect points to an afterlife.
And therefore you find these core beliefs, you should never do taqlid. You should never emulate anyone or blindly follow anyone. These are beliefs that you yourself have to rationalize, search for the proof and believe in them. That's true belief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question us in the grave about these beliefs. I can't say that so and so person said it, so I'm following them. I have to personally come to a conclusion that these are the core beliefs. So when you examine Islam at its core, it's very simple. Even if there are 10,000 religions out there. But once you look at these core principles, see which religion is compatible with these intellectual core principles. Those that are compatible, then you can investigate them. Those that are not, you can automatically cross them out. You don't have to go and spend decades to research every single religion. So while it may seem complicated, but in reality, it's very simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not burden us with something that we don't have the capacity to bear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He has required us to believe and to develop our beliefs around these core principles, it's really basic. It's ve something very simple. It's something that someone who just becomes mature, a 15 year old boy for example, a teenager, they can have a basic understanding of these beliefs. And that's the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the most important aspect therefore is our belief system. Now we move on to the second point here. And this is something very important. Today you find this being debated in colleges, universities, debate, debated by atheists. And this fundamental point is that beliefs give value to our actions. Without a solid belief, my actions, as good as they may appear to be, do they really have much value or not? Let's say an atheist who does not believe in God, but they do good acts. They could be philanthropists, they contribute to charitable projects. What about their actions? Do their actions have any value or not? For us to understand this fundamental point, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that gives value to any action? And one important question that we ask here is that who determines what's good and what's bad? We're saying that this person offered a good deed, right? Who says this is a good deed? Okay, you could say the fitrah. The original uncontaminated fitra, yes, points you to what is right and what's wrong. But can you solely depend on your fitra? No. Because our environment, our upbringing changes our fitra. Hence you have a hadith from the Holy Prophet in which he says every newborn baby is born on the fitra, but their society or their parents can corrupt that or change that. So we can't really depend on our fitra. You see there are two primary sources that guide us to what is good and bad. One is what you mentioned, the fitrah or the conscience, right? We have our conscience, our human nature, our instincts, our conscience. The conscience plays an important role in showing you what is right and what is wrong. There's no doubt about that. But is it enough? No, it's not enough. And the biggest proof is look at the world, look at what people do. Many people will commit acts of injustice, corruption, wrongdoings, and really they don't find any problem with it. Those Arabs for example, who used to bury their female infants alive, you think their conscience prevented them? Not really, in fact they considered that a good thing. Because they considered, some of them by the way, not all the Arabs, some tribes, they considered a female to be a source of shame, a source of neg negativity, it's like a curse. So in fact, by doing that, by killing her alive, then their conscience would be relieved. It can go the other way around. So you can't really depend on your conscience. 
What about society? Some people will tell you it's your society. Whatever society says is right, it's right. Whatever it says, whatever it says it's wrong, it's wrong. Can you depend on your society? No. For values, for moral principles? No. Why? Because society is not fixed. It changes. Every few decades we see our society changes. It develops new attitudes. How can you trust your society when it's constantly changing? During the time of the Arabs, for example, a lot of the corruption that they would do, it was sanctioned by their society. Like these tribes who would kill their you know, female infants alive, that was sanctioned by their society. Their society considered that something good and moral. Here in the United States, decades ago, homosexuality was seen as a disease, right? Up until the early 1970s, psychologists and doctors would even classify it as a psychological disorder. It was frowned upon, it was a taboo. Now what, what are you seeing in society? It's changing, it's being accepted. So a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, it was a bad thing. Today, all of a sudden, it's becoming a good thing, right? How can you trust your society? So was my society correct a hundred years ago, or today, or 50 years from now when it's going to change? The moral principles, these core values, they should be fixed. If they're not fixed, they really don't have much value to them. When something is fixed, it's valuable. You can depend on it, you can trust it. Look at currency as an example, the dollar for example. If the dollar was not stable, such that today you could buy a car with $20,000, but tomorrow you could not buy a pencil with $20,000. Would this currency have any value? No. One of the factors that give currency its value is the stability of that currency, right? That you can depend on it, that you could wake up in the morning, you know, knowing that $10,000 has an estimated worth of this much. You can depend on it, that gives its value. But if something is constantly fluctuating and changing, it really does not have much value. So to go back to our point, those who have no faith in God, and they allow their own conscience or their society to define for them what is good and what is bad. They don't have a firm foundation. And therefore, their actions, even though they're good actions, they don't have much value to them. Because they're not based on a fixed foundation. And hence you find the Quran in some verses in speaking about, you know, those who don't believe in God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Furqan that on the day of judgment they will come with their actions, Allah will cause their actions to blow with the wind. It's an Arabic expression to mean that their actions will not have much value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give any credit to their actions because it was not based on a firm foundation. When you come to religion however, and this is the significance of religion, this is why we need religion. When you come to religion, religion doesn't tell you, you know, to do good and to stay away from bad just because society dictates to you or just because, you know, your conscience tells you this. No, but because there are fixed rights. Religion is based on rights. A true Muslim is the one who observes these rights. I don't commit acts of injustice against others, not because my society frowns upon me when I do that, but because others have rights on me. My family has rights on me. The environment has rights on me. My creator has rights on me. Islam is based on a system of rights. And these rights guarantee to a better degree that a human being will practice them. Because when you, know, when you now know that you have rights, these rights are fixed, they don't change. The religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change. The core beliefs do not change. When you, when you know that there are rights that you have to observe, this is the benefit of religion. 
Religion gives us a system of rights that are fixed, that we can depend on, that we can trust. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us as human beings. So we see that religion plays a very important role in our lives. Now, some of you may, one, may be wondering that, okay, when we examine religion, we see that, and atheists often, you know, bring this objection. They'll tell you if religion is so good as you describe and you, you know, as you claim, then why do we see that historically the source of all problems in the world is religion? All the wars, the bloodshed, the problems that we have, they all go back to religion. Now very briefly a response to that. First of all that's not true. They make it appear so by taking advantage of the current political climate in the world to fool people to think that religion is the source of all problems in history. That's not the case. If you look at the historical wars and problems, in fact the majority of them had nothing to do with religion. The wars that were committed in history, not in the name of religion, were far more fierce and cruel than those wars that were committed in the name of religion. Look at, for example, atheistic regimes like communism. How many millions of people died because of communism? What did that have to do with religion? Historically look at the wars and the battles. World War II was a, was a war that claimed 50 to 70 million lives and it had nothing to do with religion. Yes, Hitler was supposedly a Christian but what he did was not in the name of Christianity or in the name of religion. He had a political agenda. And this war had nothing to do with Islam or any other religion. So this is one of those misconceptions that are being perpetuated in our society. That religion is the source of all problems. That's not the case. Number two, which religion? When we talk about these religions, because religion has power, because it's a reality, people take advantage of it. Once I heard one of the scholars, you know, in giving an example, uh, he would say, have you ever heard that anyone counterfeits a $200 bill? Have you ever heard that or seen that? Or has anybody been arrested for doing that? Why not? Because it doesn't exist, right? What do you counterfeit? something that's real, that it exists, you produce a fake copy of it for interest, right? One reason you see religion is constantly being abused and misused throughout history is because of this fundamental point, that religion is reality. It has power, otherwise why are so many groups, parties, regimes, governments trying to take advantage of it? Because it's reality. You're not going to go and counterfeit something that doesn't exist, something that's already fake. It's just like money, it's just like power. People, misabuse, people misuse money, they abuse money, right? Does that mean money is inherently bad? No. Is there anything, is there anything human beings have not abused in history? Name me one thing human beings have not abused. One thing. And religion is no exception. Just like humanity has literally abused everything, every dimension in their life. From their social relations, from their natural resources, from their position, from their power, from their money. Human beings abuse everything. That's human nature. The soul, as the Quran tells us, we have several types of, you know, nafs, selves or souls. We have a nafs al amara the evil inciting soul. And this brings us to abuse everything that we have. So religion is no exception, just like everything else is abused, religion is also abused. This does not mean that religion is inherently bad. In fact, when you examine the contributions of religion, most of the achievements we have throughout history go back to religion the true religions of God and at the forefront is the religion of Islam. It has offered countless contributions to humanity. You know once I was reading an article 
about the Quran that Thomas Jefferson had as he was you know writing the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution he had his own copy you can access it today you know Keith Ellison when he was sworn in he used that very copy now of course some people didn't like it because he did not use the Bible but he used the very copy that was owned by Thomas Jefferson and when you read about his life and why he used the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran has many amazing points. Gandhi would read the Quran when he was imprisoned and he benefited from a number of moral and ideo ideological concepts in the Quran for his mission, for his non-violent mission. Religion has so many contributions. Several years ago there was a study conducted at George Washington University. What they did was that they took some moral commands in the Holy Quran, some principles, some values that the Quran mentions and commands us to implement. And they saw which countries in the world are the most who implement the Quran. The results were shocking. Up until like 30, 32, there was no single Muslim nation. Number one, Ireland. Number two, Australia. New Zealand. Denmark. UK. Canada. They are implementing the Holy Quran, especially in their economic system, more than any Muslim nation. And that's why they're advanced. These are the teachings of the Quran. The problem is we've abandoned these teachings for political and various other reasons. And that's why we're backwards. This study at George Washington University realized that these countries, when you gauge them and evaluate them according to the Quran, they're not Muslim by name, but they're implementing the core concepts of the Quran more than Muslim nations. And many of them historically have benefited from the teachings of the Holy Quran, from the teachings of the Holy Prophet, from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Many sciences today you know, if you trace their origin and their acceleration, they go back to individuals like Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, and Imam al-Sadiq and the other Imams of Ahlul Bayt. So religion has offered so many contributions to humanity. And it's wrong for anyone to think that the source of our problems is religion. The source of our problem is politics, number one. And secondly, lack of religion, not religion. If religion would have been implemented, we wouldn't see the world in its current state. So, the most important aspect in our life, the most important dimension, is the core beliefs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to believe in, to embrace, and to live by. Now, when we examine the religion of Islam after the Holy Prophet the Holy Prophet peace be upon him, before he left in a famous statement that all Muslims have recorded, he said, I leave after me the book of Allah and my Ahlul Bayt. These are the source of salvation the source of guidance. If you hold on to them, you will never go astray. But what happened after, after the Prophet was something very tragic and this is a common theme that we've been discussing, you know, when it comes to the history of the Hadith, the history of Islamic law, is that after the Prophet, there were two main challenges. The first challenge was that there was a ban that was imposed on the recording of hadith, the prohibition of recording the hadith. This lasted for a hundred years until the time of one of the final and last Umayyad rulers and kings, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He is the one who lifted this ban temporarily. Of course, we had an exception of four years during the time of Imam Ali in which he also lifted the ban and he encouraged 
peop the people of his time and he had scribes who would write and document the hadith. But for 100 years there was a ban on the recording of the hadith. You can imagine what happened to the Muslim Ummah at the time. This is something that history documents. Those caliphs who came after the Prophet, they imposed a ban, they gathered the hadiths that they found and they burned them. This is not some, you know, Shia source that's claiming this. No, this is our history. I'm referring to Sunni sources here. The first Khalifa, Abu Bakr, when he rose to power, one of the first things that he did is that he had recorded 500 hadiths, he set them to fire. Now their justification was that we don't want people to be busy with hadith and to abandon the Quran. Now this was their excuse. But for a hundred years there was a ban. The beliefs of the people changed. The new generation of Muslims, they had no clue what Islam was about. Yes, the Quran was there. It's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Quran, is it enough that you just give it to someone without any explanation, any tafsir, any hadith? The Prophet throughout a period of 23 years, he explained what the Quran is. You can't just isolate that. So there was a ban that lasted for about a hundred years. This was a challenge that plagued the Muslim Ummah. And it had very drastic consequences on the belief system of the people. That's why you found decades after the Prophet, the people's beliefs had changed. Most people did not have a firm belief in the religion of Islam. They did not understand Islam. And hence you have a hadith that says after Imam al Hussein was martyred at Karbala. Now this is, I know, a very scary hadith. But it says that there were only three true Muslims who supported Imam Zain al-Abidin. Only three. Out of this entire Muslim Ummah, only three. Can you imagine? That's what happened. And then in the second century, as Muslim territories were expanding, now you had the influence of outside nations, of foreign nations. Like the Persian influence, the Roman influence. All these books were being brought from Persia, from Rome, to the Muslim world. They would be translated and people would be bombarded by these ideas and new beliefs. And they did not have a solid foundation. And this created a crisis. Many people were impacted by these you know, ideologies. That's why at the time of Imam al-Sadiq you had this wave of atheism in, in Muslim society. Every day a new sect develops. Every day there's a new idea. And this was a problem. And at the same time you had those literalists, you know the school of hadith, like the Hanbalis, who took everything literally. They considered using, it, using reason and your intellectual capacity as something that defies Islam. They also created their own sect. They ascribed, you know, um, bodily features to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these narrations found their way into Muslim books. Until today, if you look at the Sahah, you'll find, you know, um, unbelievable narrations that God has a leg, He has a body, He sits on a chair. You know, one hadith in Bukhari says on the day of judgment, God sits on a chair and God is so heavy, the, the chair will squeak. You know when you've got new furniture and it squeaks? Yes, it will make a noise because God is so heavy. And you know, to the right side of God, there is some room for four fingers. That's what the hadith says. And that is for the Prophet. He'll sit next to God. You had these hadiths and people believed in them. And you would wonder, you know, this is the core of Islam that there's nothing like God, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have anthropomorphic qualities, that He has no body. So what's going on here? But this is the problem, this is the challenge of the Muslim Ummah at the time. And you had, by the way, the people of the book, like some priests and rabbis, they found freedom in Muslim societies, they would come and spread their own beliefs. From the beginning of those caliphs, you know, especially the second caliph, he really gave them a lot of freedom, like Ka'b al-Ahbar, who was originally Jewish. 
Abdullah ibn Salam, who was originally Jewish. He opened the door to them to come and spread their beliefs. And many of the hadiths that you find in Muslim books, they were the source of it. Especially when they talk about prophet, prophets and the crimes they committed. You know those hadiths that we have in Muslim books. Prophet Lut doing so and so, getting drunk, God forbid, committing adultery, God forbid. Who was the one who was spreading these stories? It was the people of the book. You know the, the story with Prophet David. Subhanallah, it, it, the history says, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, he was so furious with this history because they would bring storytellers. How do you keep the people busy when you've banned hadith? What are the people going to discuss? You have to give them alternatives, right? One of the alternatives was to bring storytellers. And the people of the book had a lot of stories to tell. So that's why they became prominent in, in the Muslim society. Ka'b al-Ahbar, very famous. Most of the hadiths about prophets that you find in our books, you know, with some other schools of thought, they go back to him. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, this is before his caliphate, he heard that this story was being discussed. That Prophet David, peace be upon him, one day he goes on, you know, on the roof of his house and he's peeking into people's homes. Now first of all, is this something a prophet would do? You peek into people's homes and he sees this woman bathing, she was not dressed, he falls in love with, he falls in love with her, he sends after her. Now he was the king, remember David was the king. This story is still found in Muslim books brothers and sisters. David and Uriah, you can look it up. And the origin of it is the, you know, changed Bible. So basically he summons her, he commits adultery with her, God forbid. She becomes pregnant. Now when she becomes pregnant, she tells him, you know, that I'm pregnant. He realized that, you know, now he's in big trouble. So what does he do? Her husband, he was in his army. He would work in the army of David. So he sends a letter to the commander of his army, I want this person, Uriah, I want him to be at the front lines so that I'm sure he would be killed in this battle. Because when you put someone in the front lines, chances are they're going to get killed, right? So he has him killed, then he marries this woman to cover up this pregnancy. And then who's born out of this relationship? Allahu Akbar, Sulaiman, the great prophet of God. Until today, brothers and sisters, such similar stories exist in the books. You found it. Yeah, it's a famous story. You could look it up on Google. And it's mentioned in the Arabic hadiths of some other Muslim schools of thought. So you had a disaster in the Muslim world when it came to our belief system. Now who's the one who stood in the face of all this mayhem, this chaos, this corruption? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them by raising a generation of scholars who would protect the aqidah, the belief system. One of them was Hisham ibn al-Hakam. Hisham ibn al-Hakam was trained by Imam al-Sadiq in theology, scholastic theology. He was the best debater of his time. If you wanted to debate Imam al-Sadiq first go through Hisham. If you can beat Hisham, then you can go to Imam al-Sadiq Many times, you know, some of these people who wanted to debate, they would come to Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Sadiq would refer them to Hisham. Go to Hisham, debate him. Then if there's an issue, I'll debate you. That's how powerful he was in his aqidah, in his theology, in his scholarship. Mu'min al-Taq was one of the companions of Imam al-Kadhim salam. He was also one of the pillars of faith at his time. So we see the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, in the face of these challenges, they actually rose to purify the aqidah of the people, to purify the beliefs of the people through their efforts, through their hadith, and through their students. And it was at that time that you had a science by the name of Ilm al Kalam that was born. Ilm al Kalam in Arabic. Literally, if we want to translate it, it's the science of speech. But in reality, it's the science of theology, scholastic theology, which aims at defending our belief system and establishing proofs for our belief system. 
Now why was it called Ilm al-Kalam? There are a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is because at that time when you wanted to discuss theology, you had to debate and use speech. So that's why it was called the science of speech. Uh, another reason is because one of the most important debates that were being made at the time when the science was born was something the Abbasids you know, came up with to keep the people busy with so they don't object to their oppression. And by the way, for decades, you know, the scholars and philosophers, they would debate this point. In fact, people were killed because of this point. The Kalam of God, the speech of God, which is the Quran for example, was this something God created? Or was this something azali that was always with God since the beginning of existence? Some eternal as we call it. It was eternally there. You know, they just kept the people busy with this idea. You got philosophers, they would come and debate. No, we've got proofs that the speech of God was always there with him. Some would come and say, no, the speech of God, like the words of the Quran, they are a creation of God. God existed, then he created them. That's one reason why this is also called Ilm al-Kalam, because one of those first points that would highly be contested and debated as the science was you know, in its uh, uh, early stages was this issue of kalam and the speech of God. So by the way, inshallah throughout this uh, course you will hear the word kalam, ilm al-kalam, mutakallim. Mutakallim is a scholar who specializes in theology. Mutakallimin, in scholastic theology. So my dear brothers and sisters, this was just an introduction for us to know the importance of the Aqeedah. It represents the most important dimension in our life. And that the Aqeedah that we have today, it's a result of so many sacrifices of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and of their students and great scholars in history who sacrificed everything that they had to preserve these beliefs for us. Inshallah in the following courses we will start with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will examine the fundamental points about the belief in God such as atheism and how do we respond to that, the monotheistic faiths, the belief in one, in one God, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what kind of attributes does Allah have? We need to be aware of those attributes, the justice of God, and many theological debates about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then as we progress throughout the course, we will go into prophethood, imama, the fundamental differences between the Sunnis and the Shia, some very important and sensitive issues of dispute between the Sunni school of thought and the Shia school of thought. And then we go towards the day of judgment and the beliefs that surround that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. I look forward to working with you, to having these discussions. And in these discussions, we're all learning from one another. So if there's at any point you have a question, a comment, something you would like to share, you want to seek clarification about something, please feel free to do so. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin.